Welcome to the video lecture 4 on ASEAN and the role of institutions. Today we are going to look at regional governance at multiple levels. Last week in seminar 3 we were looking at the rule of law. Today or this week we are looking at the rule of institutions and the relationship between the rule of law and the rule of institutions is very close, is very strong because for us to have a good rule of law, the institutions are the ones which implement, uphold and facilitate the respect for law, the respect for the rule of law. And therefore, institutions help us to govern, help us to um, activate the law and we need to look at the institutions of ASEAN at the various levels and how they interact with ASEAN law. So the key themes that we need to bear in mind as we go through today's video lecture and as you read the seminar sheet and look at the questions, attempt the questions and read the assigned literature are as follows. Right? The key themes which we need to bear in mind regarding the rule of institutions is that when we have more and more ASEAN community building, when we have a growth in ASEAN law, there naturally needs to be an increase in the level of institutions. The level of institutionalism increases because it needs to manage the proliferation of law. Right, So we need more institutions to deal with the law and this helps to make law more effective. And the better the laws are implemented, the more effective these institutions of ASEAN are. We look today at the different institutions in ASEAN and what roles and functions they have in, you know, implementing, executing, upholding ASEAN law. We look at the executive powers because ASEAN is, you know, firmly an intergovernmental organisation. So we look at what organs these are and what uh, decision-making functions they have, right? So for the executive powers, the intergovernmental components of ASEAN decision-making, these tend to be um, the ministers from the ASEAN member states coming together at a regional level to make intergovernmental decision. Then we also have a very important institution in ASEAN, which is the centralised bureaucracy, you know, the secretary General, the four secretary, uh, deputy secretary generals, and the ASEAN secretariat, all of which work to implement the decisions that you know the ASEAN summit, the ASEAN ministers um, make. We need to look at some of the hierarchies, right? in the ASEAN uh, institutional framework and see whether there are ambiguities or you know, conflicts in competences which exist. Is there a clash between you know, the executive function versus the bureaucratic function of ASEAN? We need to explore that a little more in the video and also more deeply in the questions that the seminar uh, sheet provides. So what is the main thing that we need to look out for in the rule of institutions when we are studying the rule of law? Are there tensions and frictions between the executive and bureaucracy? This is something that we have already said. Are there issues of sovereignty where, you know, member states may say, okay, um, centralized bureaucracy, we take over and we are always, you know, the primary decision maker. Or, you know, as ASEAN moves through um, its integration process, its community building process, there is what we see in the EPG report that the Secretariat needs to be strengthened. And the Charter also gives power to the Secretariat. But in practice, 
Is there a certain type of historical path dependency where member states may be reluctant to give as much power or, you know, um, let the Secretariat do as much as what the law, the Charter says it's supposed to do, right? And what are some of the solutions to these uh, rule of institution hurdles? It has been commonly advocated, like in Walter Wound's uh, book, that we need to strengthen the Secretary General Office and the Secretariat, so the professional staff in the centralised bureaucracy that deals with you know, ASEAN cooperation and integration on a day-to-day -day basis. And more specifically, what does the you know, Legal Services and Agreements Division of at the ASEAN Secretariat do in trying to uphold the rule of law and institutions of ASEAN? So, we have seen the very substantive main themes. We go through them one by one now. So how has the rule of institutions changed, you know, after the onset of the ASEAN Charter? Some people may say, that's a silly question, because, you know, the institutions remain the same, the powers remain the same, you know, uh, there's no increase in powers, the, the organs and the bodies and the officers within the ASEAN architecture has not changed at all. But is that really true? So we need to uh, explore the facts, the evidence, and the laws, and the institutions more closely and form our own you know, opinion, our own substantiated legal arguments. So we need, we need to clarify what these various organs or bodies that exist in ASEAN are, right? We need to know their names, who, uh, composes them and what is their scope of power, right? So generally speaking, as I mentioned before, the political powers, the ministers, the heads of state, the heads of government of ASEAN still hold the primary, the topmost power. They make the, all the important decisions in ASEAN and they're the most powerful, right? Now, um, with the ASEAN Charter, we have four Deputy Secretary Generals, no more, just two. And, you know, the selection is merit-based. And as we have discussed before, the Secretary Generals, the uh, officials working in the ASEAN Secretariat are all neutral, you know. You are hired as an ASEAN national, but once you are working at the ASEAN Secretariat, you need to be working for the organization, working for the entire ASEAN region, and you cannot put forward your national interest, right? Another significant way that the Charter has brought about the rule of institutions to strengthen the rule of law in ASEAN is through the dispute settlement mechanisms. We have talked about the dispute settlement mechanisms in ASEAN in brief, in the previous seminars, in the previous video lectures. But today we examine this more closely and we will examine the dispute settlement mechanisms even more closely in uh, the following two video lectures. So video lecture five and six, right? So one institution that has become much stronger is the dispute settlement mechanism. Um, and this goes towards strengthening the rule of law, rule of institutions because dispute settlement mechanisms are supposed to enforce compliance, enforce legal obedience. There's also a new body which is the Committee of Permanent Representatives known by the acronym of the CPR. So they are the national ambassadors from every ASEAN member state sent to sit at the ASEAN Secretariat. The Committee of Permanent Representatives, when you examine the ASEAN Charter, is meant to help the rule of law and institutions, to help the implementation of the law. But at certain junctures, there are instances, anecdotal instances, where it seems to sometimes undermine neutrality. But these are certain incidences. Um, and more recent evidence is that you know, the CPR really facilitates um, the rule of law and institutions.
right? But you can see why it undermines, this office could undermine neutrality because as when you act as national ambassador for your member state to ASEAN, you can put forward your country's interests, right? And also when we look at the ASEAN Charter provision on the Committee of Permanent Representative, the CPR's powers seems to conflict somewhat or overlap with the ASEAN Secretary General's power. Now let's look at some of the ASEAN organs. And we need to note the differences in the names and structures pre-ASEAN and post-ASEAN Charter. Right? So in the pre-2007 uh, Charter, we had fewer organs, uh, and I list some of the important ones here. They're non-exhaustive, but generally speaking, with the onset of the ASEAN Charter, we definitely had more um, ASEAN organs, more ASEAN institutions, and these institutions had greater and clearer powers. So before the ASEAN Charter, we all knew that there was the ASEAN summit, right, comprising the heads of state of government. We obviously had the ASEAN ministerial meeting, you know, comprising the foreign ministers. And then now we, uh, and, and they also had other ministerial meetings because as ASEAN cooperation grew, we saw the ASEAN economic ministers meeting, obviously discussing economic affairs. And we also saw the ASEAN defense ministers meetings, you know, uh, discussing defense, regional defense issues. And then there were also committees, right, helping uh, and supporting the ministerial meetings. There are also, you know, the national secretariats. National secretariats are, are the ASEAN directorates seated at, back home, in each ASEAN member state. And these um, national secretariats help the ASEAN ministerial meeting uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, help the ASEAN foreign ministers on the ASEAN portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. And then obviously there's the Secretary General and the Secretariat. Post-charter, we have the ASEAN summit. Now we still have the ASEAN ministerial meeting, but the new name is the ASEAN Coordinating Council, right? Because the ASEAN foreign ministers coordinate the entire program of ASEAN community building, right? They coordinate, right? They may not carry out, you know, economic integration or defense cooperation, but they co help to coordinate these uh, sectors. And then there are the ASEAN community councils because ASEAN, the community has grown a lot and the areas of cooperation and integration have also proliferated. So in within each of the three community councils, we have uh, you know, ministers which have their sectoral issues um, uh, part under. So let's say uh, for uh, in the ASEAN economic community, Council, the ASEAN Economic Minister will oversee all the economic or finance related uh, issues under that community, right? And then closely related to this is the ASEAN Central Ministerial Bodies, right? That could be subsumed under the ASEAN Community Council. So let's say that if we're looking at um, uh, air transport agreements that could facilitate trade. So then the air transport sector could uh, fall under the economic uh, community, right? Then the national secretariats, again, they're the same. Um, ASEAN directorate seated at the foreign ministries back home in every ASEAN member state and the national secretariats continue to support the ASEAN Coordinating Council in um, the work of ASEAN integration, ASEAN cooperation. The Secretary General and Secretariat, we know that we have now have uh, four Deputy Secretary Generals and a larger Secretariat, and the Secretary General also has more powers and more clearly defined powers. And as we mentioned in the previous slide, there's now the Committee of Permanent Representatives instituted by the ASEAN Charter. So 
we look at each of these organs one by one. In Article 7, the ASEAN Summit, as we all know, say that the summit comprises the head of state of government, and the summit is the supreme policy making body of ASEAN. So, you know, we can't be clearer than this. It is the topmost, the supreme policy making body of ASEAN, right? It provides policy guidance, it takes decision on key issues, on the realization of ASEAN objectives, and you know, the summit takes care of all issues referred to it by the Coordinating Council, the Community Council, ASEAN sectoral ministerial bodies. So the Coordinating Council, Community Council, and the sectoral ministerial bodies, all these are top level, you know, councils and bodies which comprise ministers from the ASEAN member states. So the summit, you know, heads of state, heads of government, they direct and work on the issues related to this, uh, it by the ASEAN ministers, right? And the, because ASEAN Summit is the supreme policy-making body of ASEAN, it appoints the Secretary General of ASEAN, and it restates that the ASEAN Secretary General has the rank and status of minister, right? Who serves at the confidence and pleasure of the summit at the recommendation of the ASEAN foreign ministers. Now we go one level down, still a very important body, as we mentioned before, the ASEAN Coordinating Council comprises the foreign ministers, right? And what does this Coordinating Council do? So Article 8.2 tells us that it prepares all the meetings of the ASEAN summit, right? It co coordinates the implementations and agreements and decisions emanating from the summits, it helps to make sure that, you know, ASEAN community building is carried out in a coherent way, right? It works together with the community councils and, you know, the reports, the substantive reports of ASEAN community building arising from the ASEAN community councils will be coordinated by this coordinating council to be brought forward to the summit. What? Where do we see the National Secretariat, right? So the ASEAN Coordinating Council shall be supported by the relevant senior officials. And this is why in the ASEAN literature, we see, you know, the senior officials meeting. So these are usually the directors general of the ASEAN directorate or, um, you know, the director. So depending on what nomenclature the ASEAN member state gives, it's usually the DG, director general, or the director. Right? or the permanent secretary, uh, permanent secretary. It depends on the uh, name that the, the, the country gives. We look at the community councils. Again, another ministerial level uh, body. It comprises, and we know that in ASEAN, there are three community councils, right? So political security, ASEAN, Economic Community and Sociocultural Community Council. So each community council, as the name suggests, um, has under its purview the ASEAN ministerial, sectoral ministerial bodies. So as I gave the, you know, the air transport agreement in trade um, example before, so under its purview, you know, if you are in the transport sector, but ASEAN does not have in a transport community, but if it's, a, if it's the transport sector that deal, that impacts on trade or impacts on the economy, then it, the transport sector, the ASEAN sectoral ministerial body of the transport sector will be, you know, enfolded within the purview of the ASEAN uh, Economic Community Council. Okay, and again, we know that all these ministerial bodies need the civil servants, the bureaucrats, to help them function, so supported by relevant senior officials. The sectoral ministerial bodies, as I've given you the example of the transport sector, the sectoral ministerial bodies, you know, they need to work within the established mandate. So if you are in the transport sector, you know, your mandate is transport, right? And then you need to implement the agreements and decisions that are adopted by the under uh, by the ASEAN summit. So let's say you know the ASEAN summit does adopt many 
air transport agreements, these, uh, the ASEAN sectoral ministerial body on transport will have to implement the air transport agreements, right? And again, uh, each ASEAN sectoral ministerial body will have under its purview relevant senior officials and subsidiary bodies, right? And you can see these bodies are listed in Annex 1 of the Charter. Now, I want to highlight something. The Annex regarding the relevant senior officials and subsidiary bodies, the Secretary General may update who these relevant uh, officials and officers are. But while the Secretary General can update, it is the Committee of Permanent Representatives that makes the recommendation. So in Article 10, 2, we do see some tension in, you know, the competences. Now let's come to the National Secretariats, the ones that, you know, provide a lot of support to the ASEAN ministers. So each member state shall establish an ASEAN National Secretariat, right? So each member state needs to establish this, seats it at its own foreign ministry. So this ASEAN National Secretariat is the uh, country focal point, right? And it coordinates ASEAN decisions. Um, the minister cannot do everything. The senior official cannot do everything. So the National Secretariat needs to support you know, the national and the regional implementation of ASEAN community building. Apart from the bodies that we have just examined, we also need to look at how the rule of institution is being carried out in ASEAN. So we have seen those bodies um, and many of them are composed of uh, political leaders of the ASEAN member states, right? A political um, officials of the ASEAN member states. And how do these um, decision-making bodies of ASEAN work? We all know that ASEAN is an intergovernmental organization, right? And as part of the ASEAN way, ASEAN decision-making is enshrined in Article 20 of the Charter, and it's very, very, very clear. Consultation and consensus, this way of making ASEAN decisions has never changed since 1967. It is now enshrined in the ASEAN Charter, and they say in Article 21, as a basic principle, decision-making in ASEAN is based on consultation and consensus, right? And then they say, of course, we cannot all 10 agree all the time. So Article 22 says, if consensus cannot be achieved, the ASEAN summit may decide on how a specific decision can be made. But as the literature that Walter Woon has, has uh, written, we usually do see consensus being hammered out and this is why when you read you know the vast ASEAN literature out there many scholars do seem to say that they if it's a difficult decision the decision that is ultimately taken may be watered down to the lowest common denominator the lowest level at which point all ASEAN member states can agree and if they still if it's so sensitive that you know nobody can agree then they will just not take the decision at that point in time. And that has happened in ASEAN's history before, right? If there is a breach of the Charter on Non-Compliance, the matter shall be referred to the ASEAN Summit. I want to say that there is an exception, there's a caveat to consultation and consensus. We know that through the Charter, ASEAN economic integration is very, very, very important, right? The EPG said as much. So there is this economic formula for decision making where this, you know, 
In the imp you can see in Article 21.1, uh, 21.2, in the implementation of ASEAN economic commitments, if all ASEAN member states are agreeable, the ASEAN minus X formula may be applied. So what does this mean? If all 10 member states agree that four states can go first on economic integration, they can use the ASEAN minus X formula, which means that, you know, ASEAN 10 minus 6, the four who are ready to go first can go ahead. So your X can be every any number, right? You minus 6. If you have 6 who are ready to go, you just minus 4, right? So it can be any number. Looking beyond the political organs um, of ASEAN, let's look at the more bureaucratic powers, the Secretary General, the Secretariat. We already saw a little bit of this in the tension between the Committee of Permanent Representatives and, you know, the ASEAN Secretary General. But let's look at this, you know, in a systematic substantive way, according to the ASEAN provision, charter provision. So in Article 11, the Secretary General of ASEAN and the ASEAN Secretary the Secretary General, you know, is appointed by the summit for five years and it's, ro it's rotated among the nationals of ASEAN. So what does the Secretary General need to do? It has the a very high office and it needs to monitor, it needs to facilitate, monitor the implementation of ASEAN laws, right? So the rule of law, the rule of institutions and submit this annual report of ASEAN community building to the ASEAN summit. So the Secretary General has a very important function. It needs to be, you know, we already know that Secretary General has a ministerial level position. And so it participates in all the important meetings of ASEAN, like the summit, community council, coordinating council, sectoral ministerial bodies, and other ASEAN meetings, right? And the Secretary General also symbolizes and, um, you know, it puts the ASEAN face to the external world. So the Secretary General presents the view of ASEAN, represents ASEAN, you know, participates in meetings with external parties, right, in accordance with approved policy guidelines and mandate. So what are these policy guidelines and mandate? So as long as the ASEAN summit, the ASEAN leaders, the ASEAN ministers delegate such powers of representation to the Secretary General, the Secretary General can then participate in external meetings. Right? Another bureaucratic role of Secretary General is that um, he or she appoints and terminates the Deputy Secretary Generals. And as we have examined before, the Secretary General is really the Chief Administrative Officer of ASEAN. So you can see that Administrative Officer of ASEAN, it is a, the topmost bureaucratic uh, office, bureaucratic function, but this is in tension, with, in tension with the ministerial capacity and level of the Secretary General Office. So on one hand, you know, the ASEAN Charter says Secretary General has the level of minister. On the other hand, in the same charter, the Secretary General shall be the Chief Administrative Officer of ASEAN answering to the other ASEAN ministers. So there is some sort of tension and conflict there. Right? The other sub-provisions of um, the Secretary General and Secretariat are listed as follows. You know, these are the duties of the Deputy Secretary Generals. Um, and it stresses the neutrality of, you know, the Secretariat office, right? So you can see, highlighted in red, each ASEAN member state undertakes to respect the exclusively ASEAN character of the Secretary General and staff, right? So you cannot influence these neutral bureaucrats. The Secretary General and the staff need to act for ASEAN. They do not act for any particular ASEAN member state. Now, 
We saw the conflict before. Now we examine this more closely. What does the Committee of Permanent Representatives do? Right? They are the rank of ambassador. They sit at the Secretariat based in Jakarta. And they support the work of the community councils, sectoral ministerial bodies, work with the national secretariats, work with the Secretary General ASEAN Secretariat, facilitate ASEAN cooperation, perform other functions, you know, as determined at ASEAN Coordinating Council. So you can see that many of the functions of the CPR overlap, and if they overlap, they may very well conflict with the um, functions of the Secretary General, right? So how, so one pertinent question is how do the CPR and Secretary General functions correlate? Is there overlap, synchronization? You know, is it symbiotic or is there tension and competition? This is, um, you know, the handbook, uh, sort of like the, in a nutshell, what we, want to know about the CPR so I just list it here and this is also an illustrative uh, organizational structure showing us the pre-2007 uh, uh, ASEAN organization so you can see that before 2007 before the charter so I cannot remember uh, no I do not know which this organizational structure of ASEAN is dated but you can see that it is quite simple, right? The ASEAN Summit, the ASEAN Economic Ministers Meeting, the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting, the uh, AFMM, so that's the ASEAN uh, Finance Ministers Meetings and others. So you can see that there are committees, uh, senior officials meetings at the lower level, and then the Secretariat is under the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting. So that was a pre-2007 hierarchy. Through the years, the ASEAN Secretary General and the uh, Secretariat do have an enlargement of powers. And because of this enlargement in powers, we do see some tensions in ASEAN's, you know, organizational growth, institutionalization process. So not everything is smooth in, you know, the development of the rule of law and in the development of the rule of institutions. The rule of law and rule of institutions does meet um, some hurdle as they go, right? Some have criticized that because um, ASEAN is growing, right? Um, but ASEAN is still weak, so ASEAN, the rule of uh, institutions in ASEAN is, is not as strong as it should be. And the commentators have said that it's not because ASEAN is lacking ministerial or bureaucratic consultation, right? The problem with ASEAN and ASEAN community building, why it is not as effective as it should be, is because... Um, ASEAN member states have not welcomed the idea of a centralized permanent bureaucracy with decision making authority. And I want to stress that, you know, having a centralized permanent bureaucracy with decision making powers does not necessitate it being supranational. It can still be very much intergovernmental, right? Then there are also other kind of technical. Um, barriers to uh, ASEAN's rule of institutions uh, development because sometimes there's a lack of clarity and overlap in responsibilities and we have already seen this in you know the different provisions of the ASEAN Charter relating to the Secretary General and Secretariat vis-a-vis -vis the Committee of Permanent Representatives and maybe also, another reason why the rule of institutions in ASEAN could arguably be not as strong as what it potentially could be is because there is, you know, um, a weaker compliance 
with the rule of law, where there's a weaker compliance with the rule of institutions in ASEAN. So there is low efficacy in the institutions. Maybe member states do not want to um, uh, work with or coordinate or comply with uh, institutional processes. Now we have that we have examined, you know, the ASEAN Charter and the provisions and different ASEAN organs as well as the centralized bureaucracy and also looked we have also looked in the previous slide on some of the criticisms against um, you know the the Office of the Secretary General and the Secretariat and the critic general criticism is that perhaps we need a stronger rule of institutions. So there is this meta question that we are faced with, right? It seems very natural to ask this question. If ASEAN has so many bodies and it also what in one breath it says it wants to strengthen its centralized bureaucracy, at the same time it does not give that centralized bureaucracy that power. So our meta question is that why does ASEAN have governance institutions that it doesn't utilize fully? Why doesn't it give the uh, organs or the centralized bureaucracies the powers that they need? Right? One issue that scholars and commentators have observed is that sometimes there's mimicry, right? You know, mimicry is like mimicking. So ASEAN, as we have seen, um, especially in seminar one's readings, is that we, ASEAN has in its development, in its community building process, adopted uh, the language of the EU, right? Um, so when it has adopted some of the nomenclature used by European Union bodies, there's the expectation that ASEAN should be like the EU, but the intention is that ASEAN only borrowed the name. ASEAN does not have the intention of being supranational like the EU. So then there is the, you know, nomenclature, the naming disconnect, right? We only borrowed the name, but we didn't borrow the function. Otherwise, there is the, the other critique is that ASEAN has more networks of action rather than institutions of action. So what this means is that the institutions are not as fully empowered and as robust and as substantiated as they are supposed to be. If the ASEAN institutions were more legalized, more bureaucratized, then the rule of institutions and therefore the rule of law would then be strengthened in ASEAN. So. In some, when we look at these two, there is this gap between you know intention and ambition and the practice and reality, right? What they say and what they do, there is some sort of disconnect. So what are the ways that we can improve the role of institutions in ASEAN? Some of the comments or suggestions by you know, very senior lawyers like Walter Woon and Jean-Claude Piris are that, you know, if you want to have a strong rule of law in ASEAN or a strong rule of institutions in ASEAN, for sure you need to strengthen the secretariat. But beyond strengthening the secretariat, more specifically, you need to have a strong legal service, a stronger, you know, LSAD at the secretariat, right? And what does this um, LSAD do. It helps to clarify, you know, interpret uh, ASEAN laws, right? It helps to make sure that member states implement according to the law. It can uh, clear up disputes or, you know, miscommunication, misinterpretation of ASEAN laws. There are other things that we can do to strengthen uh, the rule of institutions in ASEAN. So, you know, making sure that the organs have clearly delineated competences, the streamlining of organs. There should be greater transparency regarding the competences and powers. Maybe we should have stronger enforcement mechanisms. 
right, to use the dispute settlement mechanisms more? Should we modify the ASEAN way, right, such that the rule of law and institutions can be on the ascendant? Should there be, you know, it can even be as technical as hiring according to the market rate. So some of these are some of the suggestions that were given by practitioners and uh, professionals uh, well-versed in ASEAN. Some of these things, some of these substantiation and empowering of competences has already um, been implemented. So we're now looking at this um, organizational structure of 2012, so five years after the signing of the Charter. So you can see the political community depart uh, security Department, the Economic Community Department, the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Department, and the Community and Corporate Affairs Department. If we really want, so one suggestion here is that if law, rule of law, and rule of institutions are supposed to be so important, then perhaps the Legal Services and Agreements Division of ASEAN should not be parked under Community and Corporate Affairs and it should have a higher ranking, you know, not and it should not be the same as the human resources division. The legal division should have a higher uh, rank. So that's one suggestion. But now let's look at the current ASEAN organizational structure. 2012, we're now 2021, right? About 10 years from there. So in 10 years, we have grown so much. We still have the three community departments in the Secretariat, right? And now we have uh, evaluation and audit connectivity because we are now in this age of the cyber, uh, uh, cyber and tech. But you can see that the Legal Services and Agreements Directorate has gone up in rank. It's still in the Community and Corporate Affairs Division, but it has gone up, right? It's not um, it's not the same level as the Human Resources Department anymore. And the LSAD, the Legal Services and Agreements Directorate, has not only moved up in rank, it has grown in specialization and professionalism. So there is now a treaty division, there's an economic and trade law division, and a general legal affairs division. So you can see the professionalization of the legal profession in the ASEAN Secretariat has been profound. And all this development brings us closer and higher up in the rule of law and the rule of institutions. So what in future are we looking at regarding um, the legal expertise that is required as ASEAN grows into a stronger rule of law and rule of institutions um, organization? The LSAD needs to grow even further, and we have already seen it, right? We now have the treaties department that will give us drafting uh, advice. It will be an institutional memory. The legal services division can monitor compliance, can help advise on dispute settlement, and it can, you know, in the future represent ASEAN if ASEAN uh, is sued, right? So these are some of the ways that, that ASEAN can take on greater legal personality and exercise greater legal functions as it grows into a stronger rule of law, rule of institutions, uh, organization. And with that, I will just leave us with a comparative chart looking at the EU because, you know, there have been many questions, not only, um, you know, within ASEAN, but from the international community about the difference between ASEAN and the EU. So I'll just leave it here. We have already examined the ASEAN to a very uh, deep degree. So let's just do a quick uh, superficial comparison. So 
The EU, as we all know, is a supranational uh, organization. It has a Council of Ministers, European Parliament, European Commission. And, you know, one of the most notable things is the Court of Justice of the European Union, all of which help to reinforce the supranational um, character of ASEAN. Yeah? And if there are uh, you know, violations of the EU law, there's the infringement procedure, the preliminary ruling request from the national courts, and the legal service of the European Commission could lead uh, the litigation process just to make sure that the rule of law and the rule of institutions in the EU is upheld. What are the more day-to-day -day functions of the legal service of the European Commission? So, you know, because the EU is so large, right? So the legal service of the European Commission has many, many functions. So it, you know, it is a legal advisor, it does the preparatory work, it gives legal opinions, it drafts, it litigates, it is a legal memory, it's a legal uh, depository, repository for all the signed instruments, right? So these are some of the, you know, plural functions that legal services do. Um, this is what the legal service at the European Commission does. And perhaps later, uh, as ASEAN grows, the, it, some of these functions could be incorporated into the legal service um, division of ASEAN. And with that, uh, we have enough to chew on on making the rule of institutions and the rule of law in ASEAN stronger as we integrate and build up the community. Thank you.